With our focus firmly on Le Mans today, we begin with the most successful team at the Circuit de la Sarthe, Porsche. The 90th edition of the Le Mans 24 hours marked a significant moment for Porsche in their illustrious history at the race. The team were taking on Corvette and Ferrari in their final works assault in the GTE Pro category. It is a very special year. It's going to be the last race of the RSI and GTE Pro with the Porsche GT team, official team. Our last victory has been too long ago, so we really want to finish and send this car off with a victory. It means everything to come back here and get the win. It's very important for Porsche, it's very important for us as drivers and uh, for the pride of ourselves. So you want to do a good race, you want to do a good job and you also want to show everyone else that we are the best. Fans came from around the world to witness the end of the Works GT era and the Porsche curves themselves were the perfect place to watch. So for me the Porsche Corners is a corner where um, you have to have respect. There is some bumps on entry, the wall is very close, it's a very fast section and for me it's never getting boring. It's from the first lap until the last lap a challenge and you have to push like hell to be fast and it's a very high chance to lose a lot of time there. You kind of sense the atmosphere while driving, but mostly when there's a safety car, you get to see all the fans next to the racetrack, people standing there watching, cheering, and you get to, to take it in and enjoy the moment. The German Mark has delivered 108 class wins since the iconic 917 first won the event. That DNA has passed through to the 911 RSR today. We're doing endurance racing. We need to be efficient. We need to be very reliable on the long distances. Le Mans is very demanding on power and car reliability, and that's what exactly the old cars had, and that's what we try to bring into every new one, and it finds itself now in the uh, actual 911 RSR. Porsche DNA from the past definitely gets all the way through to this stage. It's always a privilege to come here and uh, bring the good history record forward. 2018 winners Michael Christensen and Kevin Estra will have good reason to remember their time competing at the Circuit de la Sarthe. I've never done a race in Denmark, so what comes closest to Danish fans and so on is Le Mans. We have 20,000 fans normally here. It's very good to see them, to meet them at the camps and get to feel the support. It it's really makes you feel uh, special. To be a Frenchman in Le Mans is, uh, is something you can't really describe. Uh, first, it's the only race I do in France every year since now a while, so it's something very special, although it's very far from my home, but being French, in France, in the biggest race in the world, is something great. Most of the people know your name, you know, Kevin, here and there, and, and you have to, to jump out of the car and sign autograph and do some selfies, and you really feel like a rock star. As the work squad shift focus to the Le Mans hypercar category next season, the GT team bowed out with a smile, hoping for a victory. It's always said if something ends, especially if you have been there from the beginning. But, uh, this is life, nothing is forever. We had good moments. We said at the beginning of the year that this is the year where we can relax completely and have fun. As this program is ending, we want to end it on a high. Le Mans is the heritage, it's everything. So definitely we want to win first Le Mans and then we try to win the World Championship as well. And this would be the perfect ending to this program. We'll be back in France shortly, but we switch to drag racing next to see how a three-car team gets set for race weekend. Coletta Motorsports races all over the USA in the NHRA's Camping World Drag Racing Series. With 22 events running from February to November, it needs to be a well-oiled machine. It takes a lot of great people, uh, a lot of great coordination from all the, all the guys and gals at, uh, at Coletta Motorsports. And, uh, you know, we've got eight semi-trailers. Each team has two transporters. We have a hospitality rig. And we also have a uh, living quarters for our big boss, Connie Coletta, to stay at the racetrack. So it takes a lot of coordination, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of planning. Most of the trips are day trips from Ypsilanti, Michigan. So the guys will depart Wednesday morning. They'll get down the road, they'll get to the track, they'll get washed, they'll stage for parking on Thursday morning. Thursday morning then consists of getting everything out, the circus has arrived. Thursdays is usually a setup day, so um, and then Fridays we come in and typically make one or two runs depending on the track that we run at. But obviously the goal is to get locked in to the top 16 and get yourself in a good spot for Sunday. This is a hell of an organization. It's such a team effort. To run Doug's top fuel dragster and that of teammate Sean Langdon, plus JR Todd's funny car, Team Coletta put a lot of effort into hospitality for their partners. 
Oh man, that is, uh, that's a big job. Uh, we've got a whole staff just for that. The days of putting decals on the side of the car and making people happy are long gone. It's transformed into, you know, entertaining 200 people a day plus, getting them a great prepared meal, having meet and greets with the drivers, meet and greets with the crew chiefs, uh, pit tours, and giving them a great experience. And that's, uh, that's what we try to do, you know, every weekend. And without hospitality, we don't race. And without racing, we don't have hospitality, right? So it, it kind of goes hand in hand. Ultimately, putting on the NHRA circus is a lot of work for everyone involved, but an amazing job opportunity for those who want to get involved. We run cars all over the place, so it's, it's a busy schedule, you know, and it's a great opportunity to see the country. You know, obviously the young guys learn how to drive a semi, so there's a lot of cool things that, uh, you know, somebody that's young that wants to see the country and, uh, and be part of, you know, the NHRA uh, drag racing. It's a cool opportunity and, uh, and when your car is running good, there's nothing, nothing better. We head back to Le Mans now with American Challengers Corvette Racing. On the eve of the race at the Le Mans Drivers Parade, Corvette Racing were preparing to take on Porsche and Ferrari, and the bad boys from Detroit were soaking in the atmosphere. It's quite a lot of pressure being put on me by a lot of people, but yeah, it's good fun. It's cool to see all the fans. It's crazy here. Really one of a kind of a race in terms of this, this uh, parade that we come through the town. It's awesome. Uh, it's amazing to have the parade back. We were definitely missing the last couple of years. The fans and the atmosphere that Le Mans brings, the city that brings to this event is what makes it so special. And, makes us so excited to come back every year. Chevrolet Corvette's history is intrinsically linked to Le Mans, and 21 years competing at the Circuit de la Sarthe has inspired generations of devoted fans. I love it because of the engineering. I love it because of, uh, of the mechanics, really. It's a classic American car, isn't it? So we've got a lot to be happy about, Corvette coming over. We see Corvette flags all over the racetrack, hats, shirts. Um, you know, when we see people in town, there's lots and lots of attention on us, which is great. It's the very best day ever. <laughs> when I was at home as a kid, you always cheer for the yellow Corvettes and you stay up all night watching. And these days you read social media and everybody in America is there watching and supporting you. Taking on the world's best, America's team have amassed nine class victories in the French Endurance Classic. And the target was to chalk up another. It's been a couple years since Corvettes won here at Le Mans. And We'd like to get certainly one more with this C8R, that's the goal. The pro class is a little bit uncertain for the future, so if this is the last GTE Pro race here at Le Mans for a number of years, we'd obviously like to get that win. It's when you've got factory teams effectively from Corvette, Porsche and Ferrari, the competition will always be super strong. We need to be almost flawless and perfect through the weekend. Hope that we have a, a bit of luck along the way, but it will be nice for the last couple of hours to have a little gap and cruise to the win and get back on the, the top step of the Le Mans podium. Doing the full wear campaign is a big help for us. I mean, we just have more experience now, on the, so I think we're in a better position than we were last year. Last year we finished second, so there's only one spot up. So uh, let's see, that's the plan. Away from the planning and practice sessions, Jordan Taylor and his social media alter ego, Rodney Sandstorm, were at work around the paddock. Yeah, Jordan and his alter ego are probably both here, so uh, he's, uh, he's doing a good job and carrying on the Corvette heritage. I know he's developed some new fans, some new friends here, so it's been great. I've seen Therese already. She's the one I can always hear coming from a mile away. It's always good to see her. She's very passionate. The American team have become part of the very fabric of Le Mans, and at midday in pit lane, lunchtime is announced railroad style. We come to the racetrack, we, we get out the horn, we, we signal lunchtime, and there's actually, a, you'll get fined for painting on pit lane. But our Corvette Mark has been painted on pit lane for over 20 years, so it's, it's pretty cool to be able to be a part of that. Lunchtime! We actually forgot to uh, use the horn for lunch one day, and the FIA came down and asked us if everything was okay, so. Yeah, we're part of the show here, for sure. The Detroit squad had descended on Europe for one reason only. And with the race just hours away, Team USA were ready to take on the world. Last year was our first year here with the C8R. We finished second pretty much at the fallest race, so we've hit the ground running. The test day went very well for us. The car already feels better than it did last year. So I think we're excited for it. This is the race we want to win. The entire program is designed around 
Winning Daytona, winning Le Mans. We won Daytona a couple years back. We need to win Le Mans and get to C8 in victory lane and really make the Corvette heritage continue that on. We'll be back in France shortly, but first NASCAR as we sit down with SHR's Arik Almarola. After over 400 races in the NASCAR Cup Series spanning 15 years, Arik Almarola has announced he's stepping away at the end of this season. It was a hard decision. It was not easy to, to walk away from something that I love to do. And driving a race car is one of the coolest jobs in the world. But for me, my kids are getting to a pivotal age to where they're getting involved in a lot of their own activities. And I just couldn't see myself going forward chasing my dreams and my kids trying to chase theirs and us doing it on two separate paths. I couldn't see myself going another three or four more years and us growing further and further apart as a family. Almarola spent five full seasons with Richard Petty Motorsports and is currently in his fifth at SHR. He's always been seen as one of the hardest working drivers in the Cup Series and one who looks after his car. Well, I had no choice. When I was a kid, my grandfather made me work on my own race cars, work on my own go-karts, all those things. He was adamant that I learn it and that I be hands-on. And I, it really did change the way I approached racing because I had way more respect for the race car because I was actually working on it. I was helping wrench on it. I was helping develop setups. And so I've carried that approach into my career as a race car driver to where I'm willing to work as hard as I possibly can, study as much as I can, be involved with as much as I can so that I'm an asset to the race team outside of just holding a steering wheel. The 38-year-old won his first cup race in 2014, with two more coming so far with SHR. While he'll be looking to repeat last year's New Hampshire win this July, it'll be hard to top his perfect performance at Talladega in 2018. It was my first win for Stuart Haas Racing. It was the first win for Smithfield since joining Stuart Haas Racing. It happened in the playoffs, coming off of a race where I felt like I should have won at Dover and I didn't and then we rebounded and backed it up with a win at Talladega and it catapulted us into the next round of the playoffs where we eventually went on to finish fifth in the points championship. So it was a phenomenal year and that race at Talladega was a very pivotal moment. Almarola has made the playoffs every year since joining SHR and has had a positive impact on their younger drivers too. It's really neat for me to see the younger generation coming up, Cole and Chase and Riley. Those guys, they're so young. I remember when I was the young guy, and I remember the way I was treated by Tony Stewart at Gibbs and by Bobby Labonte and those guys. And then when I teamed up with Mark Martin and the way that he treated me and, and just the amount of respect that I had for those guys and that I tried to earn from them and the amount of information and leadership that they gave me was so crucial to get me to where I'm at today. So I enjoy having that ability to be able to help these guys. I enjoy that aspect of seeing them grow and mature in the sport. And personally too, you look at Chase, he just had a kid, right? So I'm nine years down the road on that. I've got a little bit of a head start, so I can shed some light on that and what that looks like being a new parent, trying to chase your dreams and career and all of those things. It may be a little mean to ask a driver to assess their own career, but Eric Almarola has few regrets. He's bowing out while still at the top of his game. I would say that I have done a good job in this sport. I wish I would have achieved more. I'm a very competitive person, so of course I wish I would have won more races. I wish I would have won a championship, but I scratched and clawed and just fought so hard to make the most of every single opportunity that I was ever given. There was so many things that stacked up together to get me to where I'm at today at Stuart Haas Racing. And I still have this year to go to try and achieve more things. But at the end of the day, the thing that I hope the most is that I'm just remembered as a genuine person, that I got to where I'm at today because I've made real relationships with people and that I have impacted people, not only professionally, but personally. We return to Le Mans now to join hypercar champions Toyota on race day. 
A sunny 28 degrees Celsius welcomed 62 cars to the Le Mans grid and following a stunning hyper pole lap from Brendan Hartley, Toyota's number 8 GR010 occupied pride of place on pole. It was always nice to have the pole in the, in the team and obviously you did a fantastic, uh, fantastic job there. You see it was a nice fight with all the other cars. Camus would have for sure liked to get the lap as well, but unfortunately he had a track limit. So yes, we are well prepared. I think it's more competitive than last year's, as some people think maybe not, but it will be. In Le Mans tradition, the reigning champions returned last year's trophy, and with history in mind, Kazuki Nakajima delivered it in his father's Le Mans winning Toyota 85C. Having Kazuki drive his dad's car from back in the day, bringing the trophy back, it's an amazing feeling, and uh, hopefully we can keep it for one more year. The 90th edition of the 24 Hours of Le Mans is underway. The Toyotas set off in 1-2 formation with Mike Conway in the number seven and three-time winner Sebastian Buemi piloting the leading number eight car. We know it's going to be very tough and um, it doesn't mean that we won four times in a row that this one is going to be easy. We're going to do the best we can until the end, stay focused, not think about the win, just, just a job lap after lap. As the early pit stops were completed, the number seven car moved ahead. Mike Conway's pace giving last year's winners the lead for the first time. Sebastian Buemi uh, put really fast laps in the first stint, but by doing so, he cooked his rear tires a bit and suffered in the second and third stint. That uh, opened the chance for Mike to actually jump him with a sensational in and out lap. So basically, he did an undercut and took the lead. It's a really a give and take between car seven and car eight. I love to watch it because it's still fair and hopefully it remains like this. The hypercars were driving the 24-hour marathon like a sprint race. After an off-track moment for Jose Maria Lopez, the number eight car moved back into the lead. Both cars are positive, full attack around here. Driving the GR010 around Le Mans, it definitely comes alive here. Slightly different setups, but both happy. You always feel that it was designed for this track. Problems plagued French challengers Alpine, while Glickenhaus couldn't match Toyota's pace. It left the GRO10s in a head-to-head -head battle with Kamui Kobayashi, Jose Maria Lopez and Mike Conway aiming for consecutive wins. To do a back-to-back -back would be very hard, but you know, that's what we want. We want to we wanna aim for that and also for the championship in terms of points, it will bring us back into the hunt. So we are looking for a good result here and hopefully, yeah, can bring it home. Alongside Sebastian Buemi and Brendan Hartley in the sister car, Ryo Hirakawa was hoping to become only the fifth Japanese winner. In a stunning dogfight, the lead shifted between the two cars as the sun set over the circuit. For drivers, it's a special time in the cockpit, but tiredness is setting in. The fatigue is something that is there and you know in the morning it's going gonna, it's gonna to be there. I mean, we try to sleep and optimize the recovery, but you are tired because it's been a couple of tough weeks. You know, you, you have to sleep, you have to rest, because it's really hard, you know, when the adrenaline and everything is going on. It's a very tricky uh, part of the race. Night drew in and mere seconds still separated the two Toyotas. For now, the team were on schedule for a fifth consecutive victory. Well, at the moment, it's going very well. The seven and be just behind the eight. At least as I came out of the pit, it were only one second. At the moment, no issues on the car, but we know it's the night. Things can happen there. We have seen our competitors from Glickenhaus and Valpine had some problems, so fingers crossed. But uh, yeah, at the moment, we cannot complain. Sunrise at the Circuit de la Sarte saw Toyota's two hypercars running first and second after swapping the lead in an epic battle through the night and drama in the early hours. Towards the morning hours, we had an electronic Kremlin uh, that meant uh, car 7 had to stop on track to do a power reset. New error, new error. Stop the car and power cycle. The reason is something on the front motor uh, didn't communicate right. Now we about five and a half hours to go. It's still a long time. Still a lot of things can happen. And this is Le Mans. You lose the lead, the potential victory, very quickly. The morning also brought drama to GTE Pro. After its sister car suffered suspension failure in the night, the number 64 Corvette was hit by AF Corsa's LMP2 car. The C8R of Alex Sims has been tipped into the Mulsanne barriers. What a tragic end to the Detroit squad's quest. The incident promoted the number 91 Porsche into the class lead, putting the German mark on course for victory in the GT team's final assault on Le Mans.
In the fight for overall honours, the number eight hypercar now maintained a comfortable lead, but with just an hour to go, nothing was taken for granted. We have seen problems with car number seven this morning. We don't want to have this repeated, nor on the eight, nor on the seven. So therefore, hopefully, fingers crossed, without drama, four o'clock finish line. Four o'clock struck, signalling emotional scenes at Porsche. Jimmy Bruni, Richard Leitz and Fred Makovecki claiming a famous final GTE Pro win. While in a 1-2 finish, Brendan Hartley bought the number eight Toyota home for the overall victory, two minutes ahead of the sister car. The 90th running of the Le Mans 24 hours comes to an end. It's an historic fifth consecutive victory for Toyota Gazoo Racing. I think this one was maybe uh, one of the most uh, emotional things uh, to watch it from outside. Actually, the pressure was maybe even bigger than the one I had uh, as a race car driver. We had a slight issue on car seven, which was uh, very unfortunate. And yeah, tired crew, I think they had a race without any issue on the car, any mistakes from the driving. So uh, I think we all deserve uh, this victory together. So really happy for that. Next time, can anyone match Magnificent Max? And the hundredth running of the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb. We'll see you then on Mobile One The Grid.